This is Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. I'm Kay Savitz. Today's interview is with Mark Simonson, who used his Atari computers to create art that was published in magazines in the 1980s, including a portrait of Nolan Bushnell that was commissioned by TWA Ambassador, an in-flight magazine, a colorful street scene for the cover of Minnesota Monthly, the magazine of Minnesota Public Radio, and a juggler for the cover of Credit Union Advantage magazine, among others. Professionally, Mark is a font designer. He created Atari Classic, a free true type font family for modern computers that looks like the Atari 8-bit screen font. Today, you'll see Atari Classic used in many Atari emulators, websites, the Woodson IDE, and elsewhere. This interview took place on April 15th, 2021. Sometimes I talk to people who literally haven't thought about Atari in 40 years. And right, <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's been on my mind lately. Why has Atari been on your mind lately? Um, I have a tendency to have sort of serial obsessions where I'll be obsessed with something for a few weeks or maybe sometimes even a few months. And uh, this was a case where I just happened to see something that triggered one of those sort of falling down the rabbit hole moments uh, where I saw somebody um, uh, on YouTube basically talking about uh, how to program in basic and assembly language on Atari and stuff like that. And um, it sort of triggered <laughs> my, uh, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, I haven't messed with that stuff for a while kind of uh, thing and, and uh, got my, and, and also I, I think I'd seen, that was not only that, it was also this guy, I mentioned both of them in my Atari age post. I, I'm blanking on them off the top of my head here, but um, it was a guy who basically showed how to make a um, uh, serial, uh, um, what do they call it? Uh, SIO to PC USB cable um, without any soldering since I don't really do much soldering. And, uh, and so I, I did that, I, I basically built a cable, had, had some difficulties with it, and finally it actually got it, but it got it working um, using uh, Aspect, I think. And, um, and then realized that after like sort of posting about it on Atari Age, because I was having some issues, uh, that I actually bought something like that a few years earlier from um, Lotharic. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, which is actually a fully assembled, like really nice USB to, uh, you know, yeah, SIO to PC cable. And I, I had never got it to work when I bought it originally. I don't know if Aspect or Respect was not around there then back then, or I mean, this is like in 2016 or something like that. But anyway, I started messing with that and then uh, started discovering that there was this FujiNet thing. Yes. Which I kept seeing it pop up and I thought, I don't know what that is. It's something about like playing network games or something like that. I don't really care about that. And, but then uh, one of these guys like posted a thing about it and I thought, oh my God, that's like amazing. And I of course sent for one and, uh, and it's just been, you know, down the rabbit hole ever since. The FujiNet is pretty amazing. Yeah, like yeah. So I sort of switched it. back and forth between those two methods of that. Mostly, I use the FujiNet because it's more convenient. But, um, but I've I basically get, figured out how to get a TNFS server running on my Mac, and I have it pointed to the same folder with all my um, emulator uh, disk images that I, disk images that I use with the emulator um, Atari 800 Mac X or whatever it's called. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's really cool. I can just like, you know, uh, like sort of switch back and forth and seamlessly. And, um, I also, uh, sort of spend some time going through all of my existing discs that I may or may not have transferred. I've transferred a bunch of them back in the nineties, uh, when I was first getting into this emulator stuff. And, uh, anyway, I managed to get whatever ones I could find that were left that hadn't been transferred. Um, I also, I, was, I think before I got the FujiNet, I got a, um, uh, one of those SIO to SD um, mm -hmm. devices. 
this is before I knew about the FujiNet. If I'd known about the FujiNet, I wouldn't have bothered. But um, you know, where you can just basically put everything on an SD card. I had something similar to that from Lotharic back in around 2015, 2016, but it wasn't very, it was very complicated to use and had all these little buttons that you had to press in certain orders and seemed like kind of a, this, these newer devices uh, are a lot more convenient, particularly the FujiNet. Yeah. So did you find any new old stuff on the disks that you transferred recently? I did. I found some, some, I, I went through and basically documented all of the, you know, Atari basic and, and basic Excel programs that I wrote back in the eighties and uh, found some things I'd forgotten about. And also some, some pictures that I would made, you know, using Atari artists or micro painter or whatever. Um, and it's just started like obsessively documenting every single disc. I sort of started doing that maybe, you know, five years ago and didn't get very far. Um, maybe it was 10 years ago. I'm not sure. I got, it, this is one of those hobbies that sort of comes and goes. Uh, uh, but yeah, I, I sort of went through and basically made uh, text files documenting every single disc and what was on it and running all the software, all the programs I'd written and taking screen snapshots and, um, and the emulator and documenting everything and just just kind of uh, doing what I, I tend to do with my on the Mac side where I'm, I'm pretty obsessive about everything being organized and like I never, I never delete anything I just you know it just keeps up taking less and less space as time goes by you know so why why not why throw it out you know it's right like, no I'm in full agreement disk space is so cheap that yeah it just keeps getting cheaper and mm -hmm. taking up less space and you know like I used to have like you know boxes of floppy disks and cds and stuff like that and none of that's necessary anymore my entire atari collection you know fits on like a thing the size of a thumbnail right all right, so let's go back to the early. So let's go back to the, the before, before the beginning. If you could okay. tell me how you got started with with computers, and we'll go from there. Um, uh, well, back in the late mid to late seventies, I, I sort of could see that computers were becoming a thing. Personal computers, home computers, stuff like that. I had a sort of a passing interest. My dad is, had sort of an engineering background. He was into it probably more than I was. Was into the idea. Um, and, but I was kind of like, I was sort of a sort of counterculture back then, not exactly, but I was sort of, uh, wasn't really that big on technology stuff in the, when I was like in college and stuff like that. And, and uh, but then I uh, happened to see uh, Ted Nelson's book, um, Dream Machines uh, and Computer Lib. It was sort of like two books in one. Right. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but Never it's, it's actually worth some money now, I guess. But um, but yeah, it, it just happened to be in a bookstore, like, almost like somebody put it there because they didn't know what to do with it. And I bought it and it just kind of blew me away, uh, just all the ideas in it. And uh, that this, it, I got the sense that actually computers were, were really fun and you could do really cool stuff with them. And I sort of dip my toes, I got a little sharp uh, organizer thing, which is kind of like a glorified calculator that had a calendar in it and stuff like that. And thinking that would be a cheap way to sort of get a taste of it and that, that wasn't enough. So I ended up getting a Sinclair ZX80 or ZX80 as they call them in the UK, <laughs> uh, which was also kind of fun, um, very super primitive, only one K of RAM you, know, you just hook it up to a black and white TV in a, in a cassette player. And, but I got a taste of it and I thought, oh, I need to get something that better than this if I'm gonna get serious about it. Cause it was very unforgiving, uh, very difficult to use cause you couldn't actually type in basic programs. They had like special, like each command was on a separate key and it was like a little tiny membrane keyboard about the size of a, an iPhone. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I was sort of thinking about, I was looking around at uh, things like the Apple II, which is kind of expensive, Go, going around with my dad to computer stores like Computerland and 
uh, stuff like that and seeing like, you know, these Exidy sorcerers and, um, you know, some really primitive, um, I, I remember seeing Commodore Pets, uh, you know, the, you know, of course Apple II, but it was, it cost like $2,000 or something like that. And it's like, you know, you need to buy something like this so you can balance your checkbook, you know, it's like, you couldn't do much with them back then. But then I saw, uh, went to this little tiny sh hole in the wall shop uh, uh, and they had an Atari 400 running Star Raiders. And I sort of knew what the Apple II could do with the graphics and stuff like that and wasn't very impressed. And this was just like amazing. I mean, it was like, you know, full 3D rendering for its time. Uh, and I thought, oh my God, it's, you know, this thing is only about 400 bucks. You know, I can afford that. And so I bought one and, you know, was just totally hooked and, you know, started turn, teaching myself to write basic um, and uh, started getting a little bit into a learning assembly language. Oh, I never got very far with that. And also fourth with the Valforth package, which I was always looking for shortcuts and it seemed like easier than assembly language to get like make fast programs. And I had all these ideas for games and stuff like that. And only thing I ever ended up really writing in on my computer was like sort of graphics demos, like sort of things that would draw random pictures and also a little uh, paint program that was kind of really a modified version of one from Compute Magazine called the Fluid Brush, where you uh, would draw with a joystick. And I modified it so it would work with um, the GTA modes, uh, Graphics 10 and Graphics 9, and uh, ended up using it to do some images for magazines and things like that. I was a graphic designer, magazine uh, art director at the time. Uh, working at you know, TWA Ambassador, which is an in-flight magazine, and uh, worked at Minnesota Public Radio back then for a while. And there's a computer store right across the street from there that I used to go to called Computer Castle. And so, lots of fun. I used to bring my Atari in and like do calculations in VisiCalc to do type, like copy fit typesetting and stuff like that. Wow. So you were doing work at magazines probably before they were really using computers. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, back then it was like I was trying to figure out ways to use them. <laughs> and even when I finally got a Mac and I got a Mac when they first came out, um, it wasn't even really possible to use that for magazine production. Um, again, I sort of used, made, took my copy fitting spreadsheets and moved them over to multi-plan on the Mac. And, and I would do like lay, try to do layouts in Mac Paint and stuff like that, little thumbnail layouts and things like that. But uh, yeah, it wasn't until uh, a few years later that it, things totally changed with the desktop publishing. Sure. So today you are well known for your work designing fonts, mm -hmm. um, but you did some fonts back on the Atari. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, like I was already interested in designing fonts back then, even in college, um, which is in like mid seventies. Um, it was just this, one of these things that was always in the back of my mind. And um, I could see that it, it, there was like a, uh, some font editors on the Atari one called, um, that I used called Font Edit, which was part of a little collection of software, on a sort of a, um, what it was called it was like a little it was almost like a subscription shareware thing mm -hmm. uh, where you get a cassette that has you know some programs on it that you can run uh, and it was one that was called font edit and not works not works was like for making like celtic patterns and uh, um, anyway they this font edit program was worked well enough and i and i sort of design, made some fonts, a bunch of different fonts. Um, it, it was very limited because you're just stuck with the, you know, eight by eight matrix. And um, you couldn't really use more than one font at a time on the Atari uh, very easily. And so I never actually used them for anything. I just had fun making them. Um, 
I think I, well, I sort of imagined that I would use them in a game or something like that if I wrote a game. So a, a few of them are sort of connected with ideas for games and stuff like that. But, but yeah, I never, never released them or did anything with them. And uh, of course, the, the Mac had proportional spacing in the black on white screen. And I got the Apple font editor and started making bitmap fonts for that right away, as soon as I could and eventually making uh, PostScript fonts. Sure. Do you think that starting working on creating computer fonts on, on the on the Mac and on the Atari before that, did, did that help you, you know, give you a, 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 a head start later when, when you were doing fonts in, in PostScript and TrueType? And a little like bit. I mean, to be honest, when even when PostScript fonts came along, it didn't seem like they were real fonts. They were just like for computers, <laughs> which at the at that back then were sort of like this exotic thing in a way. Um, you know, if you wanted real type, you would send out to a typesetter, um, and or you would buy a you know a copy graphic machine or something like that in house. That's what we had at NPR, um, and. So even though I was interested in type design, even in the late 70s, early 80s, I wasn't thinking about trying to do them myself on a computer at all. Um, I thought that was way, like, way too high end that, you know, like places like Linotype or whatever had big machines for doing that, that had, you know, that cost millions of dollars and uh, no way was I gonna actually put, get my hands on something like that. Um, so I, I tended to think of the, that these computer fonts were just like for hobbyists and just like maybe for use on in in a computer program or something like that but i the, the idea that you would ever use any of this stuff to actually set type was something that didn't even occur to me early on sure um, but it, it did the atari did um i think my experience on that did come in handy when uh later on making fonts because you can get a lot done by um, scripting in the font editors. So they're nearly all Python based. And so uh, having that, you know, experience uh, learning to program in the Atari came in handy later when I was learning to do Python scripting to manipulate fonts and font data and things like that. Interesting. Python's almost exactly like fourth. <laughs> yeah, nothing like it. Well, one thing that is like fourth though is PostScript. Is it? Yeah, it's 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 actually a fourth based language. Oh. Um, it's different, but if you know fourth, it'll look very familiar. It's all stack based. Um, it has some, like any fourth system, it's it is extended way beyond, you know, uh, the basic thing but the reason they used it was because it was fast and compact and they were trying to squeeze it into a ROM chip on a laser printer um, so yeah it's like it's like and it's that's still um, like what's inside of mo a lot of modern fonts is that, that's the sort of reverse Polish uh, notation uh, instructions you know like you know you put the coordinate first and then it would be like draw to or line to or whatever um and it was really just because it was very compact and uh, they wanted it to be interpreted um, and it's and if you look at pdf pdf is based on postscript and so if you were to open up a pdf and look at the like textual representation of it you would recognize it as very forth like you did a uh, portrait of nolan bushnell in uh, TWA Ambassador Magazine in the GTA graphics mode. Uh, I couldn't find that scan online, but it looks like that image was, you did hopefully allow reproduction in a high res magazine issue number mm -hmm. one. Um, yeah. Can you tell me about how and why you made that? Well, I wasn't working at Ambassador anymore at that point. It was like, I left there in 81. This was in 82. Um, but they knew that I had an Atari computer. I bought it in 81 while I was still there. Um, and the uh, new person who was art director, 
uh, after I left, uh, asked if I would, you know, could I make a like a portrait of this guy on my Atari computer because it was all going to be about Atari and stuff like that. And I said, yeah, sure, of course I can. <laughs> you know, it's like, and uh, you know, I, I had already sort of made this, you know, thing that was based on the Fluid Brush and Compute magazine, and figured out a way to. Um, get it to save files and stuff like that. It, that wasn't part of the original program. It was really super basic. It didn't have any way of opening or saving files. Um, and I had to, uh, because it was portrait orientation to fit on a magazine page, I had to like sort of turn my TV sideways while I was working on it sometimes to check my work. And I also, the way I digitized it, because it's based on a photo of him, um, is that I basically, got a photostat made of of the photo or something like that some kind of copy photocopy so it was like about the size of my tv screen and then i traced onto acetate or clear plastic um kind of the general sh color areas and shapes and stuff like that and then put tape that to the tv screen in order to uh, uh, reproduce the photograph um, so i had to be you know careful and you know, you only had nine colors to work with. So I had to figure out which nine colors would work to uh, get the best likeness and things like that. And in the end, just uh, took a photo off the TV screen and that's what they printed. Cool, nice. And you did some other art for various other magazines, um, I think after that. Yeah, yeah, and I, I was, so that this, um, Ambassador magazine, the in-flight magazine, so it had a publisher that published a number of other magazines, um, including The Farmer and Beef, which had a logo like Life magazine, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Uh, and so some of this, them in here seen what I had done in Ambassador and I ended up doing some illustrations on my Atari for various agricultural related articles and there was one for I think AAA magazine had a they had that was one of the magazines they printed there and I did it like a computer license driver's license thing uh, so I did you know like a half a dozen things and I was also working freelance for a uh, this sort of credit union magazine and uh, used a program called Atari World which let you sort of make um, 3D wireframe uh, models and I used that to sort of make a represent, it was an article about, oh, the home computer, you know, and it was like, I, so I did a, a graphics nine image for the cover of some kind of concept about computers. And then inside we had these photos from my Atari screen of these wireframe models of a quote unquote computer system, you know, that were used in the article. So just things like that, it was, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, oh, and then also when I was at NPR, which is, this is after Ambassador, um, I did a few uh, images for that. I did. We did a um, cover story on home computers, and uh, I did a sort of mock mock video game on the cover of uh, you know a bunch of houses. So it's like homes on the computer screen, basically. <laughs> It's it's an adorable image. Uh, reminds me of the game Paperboy a little bit. Yeah, that, and that's sort of I was trying to make it look like a like a video game like that. You know, sort of a diagonal scrolling video game uh, like Zaxxon or uh, what's the one the airplane one? Uh, Blue Max. Right, right, Blue Max. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, and then inside I used um, a program called Graphics Master to uh, basically make my own head headline type. Um, so I basically draw, drew, the, drew a bunch of letters uh, one by one. It wasn't like a font editor or anything like that. It was usually like just dot by dot making uh, letters. And then I would make a copy of that file and then reassemble headlines and then print them out on a dot matrix printer uh, and then take photostats of them and use those for headlines inside the issue. So I was figuring out ways to I was always like look, trying to figure out ways to, you know, use the computer and design and graphics and stuff like that. So for this art at this point, it, are you doing this with a joystick, with a qual pad, with combinations of things? 
Yeah, some of it was, a lot of it was with the joystick. Um, the um, special, I mean, some programs only worked with the joystick, like Fun with Art was the one I used to make a bunch of these, uh, just because you could use more colors than four. <laughs> Uh, and it was higher res than the uh, graphics nine or 10. And, um, but I did do some of them with the Atari artist or maybe it was Micro Illustrator, I don't remember which, they're both kind of the same program, uh, either with a Qualipad or the Atari tablet. Um, so one of the ones I did for um, the farmer, I think was done with that, where it's sort of a cartoon face. Um, and I, that, that was the, the, the uh, drawing tablets were, those were great. And I did, I had a lot of fun. I probably made more image files with that than any of the, any of the others. It sounds super painful to use a joystick to do anything as it detailed was fun, as these. Though. At the time it was like, wow, this is so cool. You know, it's like, and even as primitive as the, like the, the program that I made to do the Nolan Bushnell image, um, you couldn't pick up your pen. So it was a little bit like an Etch-a-Sketch where you could change colors, but if you needed to move the cursor over to a different part of the image, you had to keep changing colors as you went along um, because of those you'd plot points in a different color and ruin the stuff that was already drawn. <laughs> so he had to be very careful and plan things out. And I, mean, and I eventually did some like revisions to that program. I, I, I think I was thinking that maybe I would try to make a commercial product or something like that. So I, I kept working on it and made it so it would work on a, with a graphics tablet and it had a cursor that used player missile graphics to, uh, you know, so that I wouldn't uh, have to like be drawing on the screen while I'm positioning the cursor. Um, and I even did some updates to that program when I got back into it this la in the last six months and uh, kind of added some features and uh, you know, improved the uh, user interface a little bit. And uh, also I've been like updating some of my sort of little graphics demos that draw random things. And so they work in more than one mode and things like that. And you can pick different options. Like it doesn't just draw randomly. It draws just like perpendicularly or in diagonals or whatever. And I kind of, you know, it's sort of a dumb program that doesn't really do much. Uh, but it's, it's, it's fun, you know. Nice. So probably anyone who has used an Atari emulator or gone to an Atari website has seen your work in, uh, in the, the form of uh, Atari classic chunky, the right. font, which has become the, the standard Atari font that everyone uses. Um, can you tell me about how are you creating that? Yeah, so when I was first making, you know, PostScript fonts back in the 90s, um, and I released a couple by like 94 or something like that, didn't really make any money on it, but it, I hit a period where I was, I think I was um, messing around, it was when I was messing around with emulators in the mid 90s and transferred my files over and stuff like that. Uh, and I was using this emulator called Rainbow by Chris Lamb that was out at the time. Yeah, I remember that. And uh, yeah, he actually mailed me a floppy disk. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the days. Uh, all the way from the UK. Uh, and uh, anyway, I thought, oh, it'd be cool to make a, like a font, like an outline font that was based on the Atari screen font. And so I just did it for the heck of it um, and did like two, ver like three versions of the chunky version that you mentioned is just the straight square bitmaps. Um, but I thought, you know, I should make one that looks sort of maybe a little bit more like the way it looks on the screen where things are sort of smoothed out a little bit. And so I made one where the corners were kind of clipped off at an angle called uh, smooth. And then one where things were even more rounded off called extra smooth. It's a little bit of a peanut butter metaphor there, but uh, <laughs> so you get chunky, smooth and extra smooth. Uh, uh, and around this time, I was also, um, learning how to do websites, uh, make, you know, HTML and stuff like that. And I thought, well, what can I do? A, what kind of website can I do just to practice? And I thought, oh, I'd make an Atari website. I, there weren't that many of those around at the time. And maybe I would do one that was just about like focus on like using 
your Mac with Atari stuff. And so I created the Mac Atari Fusion site, which is still a tilde site on my original ISP. Uh, you know, it's a, it doesn't have its own domain or anything, but but that I so I put the fonts up there because I needed something to put on the site, and uh, and little by little the fonts started getting used by people. Um, I think there was a couple other Atari Outline fonts that were out back then, um, but I think I guess it's the only one that really caught on. And in like 2012 or so, I heard from um, this Woodson guy. Um, uh, um, what's his name? Peter. Yes, I know who you mean, Peter at Woodson. Yes. Yeah, Peter Woodson. Yeah. Anyway, he um, asked me about it because he was trying to use them in his IDE for like his cross compiler thing for making Atari programs uh, and wanted to be able to show like hex dumps, like where he had like a hex editor in it and wanted to be able to easily like show what the Atari ad, ad ASCII characters were. Um, and wondered if there was a way I could modify the font so it would work for that. Because the way I had done it is I tried to put all the lower ASCII stuff in the, or lower at ASCII stuff in basically in the lower ASCII areas, which a lot of them are like control characters and things like that. And so it doesn't really map directly onto at ASCII between, there's sort of an incompatibility and there were some characters that there wasn't even a place to put them. And not only that, you couldn't type any of them. Um, so it was really difficult to use it. You could sort of use it to, like if you import, brought a um, Atari text file in and open it in a text editor on a Mac and change it to this font, you'd get most of the control character, the lower ASCII characters, but not all of them. Anyway, um, between where, when I was working with him and then realizing what he had to do, I was realizing, well, all he had to do really is just move all the low ASCII characters, low at ASCII characters into like a big a higher plane in Unicode. So you had the, the basic, you know, the ones that were the same as ASCII, the ASCII standard in their usual places. And then the low at ASCII characters got bumped up to, I forget what it was like, E something or other, which is like, um, like, you know, a different plane, if you know what a plane is in, a, in Unicode. So it's like, it basically you add, I think you add like 128 to the character code or, or something like that. I don't remember exact, the exact number. Um, and you would, that would point to the, the graphics characters. And I also had it so it would show the inverse characters and the um, European character set with the accents. And so basically this new version of the font that I eventually released in 2016 has um, the full support for the entire ad ASCII character set and all the different incarnations. And, uh, and that thing has you know, been used out all sorts of places too. Like it's used in FujiNet, I think for printing. And um, I noticed that Atari 800 Mac X uses it for printing and for like, other things. So it's obviously become useful for people working on uh, doing software and hardware solutions that work with the Atari stuff. Yeah. Um, and then I've also seen it on like manuals and websites and YouTube videos and including like the, the smooth and the smooth and extra smooth versions. So it's, it's really cool to see that because, uh, you know, I just put it out there thinking, not really thinking anybody would necessarily use it but uh it's, it's really cool to see it uh, it was it was prescient used. i mean because you didn't uh, know that retro computing was going to become such a thing sure sure 20 it, years it later like it was there's sort of a little bit of it in the mid 90s but it was almost like it was just people that just wouldn't let go with it or something, <laughs> right. rather than people trying to revive it <laughs> <laughs> yeah i resemble that remark <laughs> But I mean, I had all my stuff back then too. So like I was using it off and on over the years. Um, a lot of times it was just sitting in the basement collecting dust. Uh, and at one point, oh, well, of course, at one point um, I heard from you after I uh, put my website up. I, you must have seen my website or something and contacted me. 
I, I looked at my email trying to find out like when we first, I feel like I've known you online forever. And yeah, it seemed, but it my like first email that years. I found from you was in 2000, but that was not the first. Yeah, yeah, that's about right. Yeah, that's about right. So that would have been when my site was up for maybe a year or two. Hmm. And uh, yeah, and you were, you asked me about scanning old Atari magazines and OCRing them and stuff like that, which I was doing for you for a while um sorry i made you work helping on it. yeah it was fun but then i realized this is just taking up too much time and i ended up just shipping you all my magazines <laughs> <laughs> yes see the atari magazine site went up in 1996 uh, so I, mean, I don't know if you did the graphics right off for the first I did version not I at first no, no but I, and i right and i i did do help you with the graphics on the, the two sites you were working on back then Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, it was it was fun because I was like I was trying to do web. This is before I really got to be a in the font into the font business seriously, and I was like trying to do web design back then, and uh, uh, so that was like a sort of a fun way to do that and learn about it. So I was doing a lot of stuff in Fireworks and Dreamweaver and things like that, but. Uh, well, I love that your your Mac Atari Fusion website is still up. That shows a real commitment. <laughs> yeah, it's just like I never I don't want to throw anything away, you know, including uh, things like that. You know, just leave it up, and and I do get, you know, I, who knows what kind of traffic I get there. I have no way of knowing, or at least, well, I suppose I could, but just like there's some kind of way of looking at the stats on those pages on that on that old server, but uh, but yeah, it's. I just leave that stuff up because why not? Sure. It always bothers me when links go dead. Yeah. It's like I go through my bookmarks every once in a while and delete the ones that have gone dead. And it always makes me a little sad. <laughs> yeah, indeed. And then you hope the Internet Archive has a full copy of whatever it is you right. need. And yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I need that just for my own site when I'm trying to find something that. Uh, some version of something that used to be up on my my main site for my font business, which I've redesigned a few times. And some of the stuff that used to be there isn't there anymore. And I think, oh, what do I do with that? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> uh, Internet archive to the rescue. Right. Um, do you ever get confused with the uh, Mark Simonson from Beagle Brothers? I remember hearing about him like back in the magazine days because I would see uh they he wrote software for the apple ii and so you look in like creative computing or computer whatever and beagle brothers wrote you know took out ads in those magazines and i said oh this is this other more famous mark simons <laughs> a bunch of util i think he made a bunch of utilities or something like that yeah yeah he did a lot of a lot of popular programs yeah so can, can, can we diverge a little bit and can i talk to you about the the business of making fonts Sure. Yeah. I'm, it, nothing, not much to do with Atari, but I, I am curious about it. And uh, okay, um, I mean, you have on your website many fonts that you've created. They're they're mm -hmm. beautiful. I'm I'm kind of like a, a dilettante. I'm like I that's pretty. I like that, and I have no reason to use them. I don't know how to create them. I don't you know I don't know where monkeys come from, but you know, <laughs> but but I like it. Um, so how do you? How do you decide what to create? How, I mean, to when you're going to work on a font, it seems like a real commitment. How do you like? This is what I'm going to do next. Well, um, I mean, for, first of all, like you know, I, I've been kind of been obsessed with typography since I was in high school. Like I used to get rubbed down type sheets and and set my own type and stuff like that, and for the school paper and uh, you know, and, and in college, and also was I was learning to do lettering and and stuff like that, and in college, I we had an assignment to make, you know, design a typeface, basically on paper. Uh, didn't have computers or anything. Uh, no way to really set it or anything like that. Just you just had to draw but an alphabet basically. And I thought I thought it was really fun to try to come up with ideas. And I just kept on uh, brainstorming ideas after that and and thinking about it. And also, I saw a thing where you could get uh, paid like a some money up front to design a font and then you would get royalties. This is like back in the seventies. Um, and I thought, oh yeah. And then I, I heard that some 
guy in Minneapolis made like $50,000 from royalties on a font or something like that. <laughs> you know, like, wow, I could, this could, you know, I've been, this could be like a career path or something. And so I kept working at it and, you know, actually tried to get some published in the late seventies with no luck. And, uh, and then when the Mac came along and you could make fonts with a fontographer, that was a, like an early font editor that was late eighties, I think 89 or something like that. Or was it that late? Yeah. 87, 87. Um, I started sort of, thinking, oh, I could use this to like help design it. And then they would turn it into a real font when I get it published. And I had no idea that these PostScript fonts are actually gonna go anywhere. But, um, but then they started to, and in the early nineties, I started making more fonts and trying to get them published and ended up getting a few published in the early nineties. Uh, so like, one was based on a handwriting called Feltip Roman. And then there was also this Proxima Sans and another one called Kundal, which were both ideas I was working on back in the 80s. And, and then when web fonts took off, or not web fonts, when they started selling fonts on the web around like 2000, it's like in the 90s, they were actually mailing out floppy disks and CDs and stuff like that um, and printing paper catalogs. Uh, very, it was very expensive and the royalties were really low. Anyway, uh, my fonts came along in around 2000 and I started selling fonts on there and it said it what I did much better there than I ever had with the traditional publishers. And by 2005, I was making enough to quit my other work and that's what I did and I haven't looked at back since. So been doing fonts full time since like 2005. Uh, mostly thanks to one particular family, Proxima Nova, which has been a big hit, especially on the web when web fonts became a thing in about 10 years ago. Hmm. You said at the start of this conversation that you can be a little bit OCD. It, it seems like in order to make a font, you'd have to be super OCD. Yeah, I, I well, would get halfway through the I, alphabet and be like, mm. <laughs> right. Tiny over yeah, here. It, you have to, it's, it's sort of meditative, you know, it's like, it's like doing Sudokus or something, you know, it's like, uh, there's sort of a, a, I think it, it sort of appeals to me because it's a combination of like art, you know, like drawing things, which I like drawing things. Um, but there's also kind of a technical side to it. And I enjoy sort of the technical side of things in the mid 90s when I was sort of getting tired of doing graphic design and thinking I wasn't getting anywhere and uh, wondering what my career path was going to be. I was actually thinking about like going into computer consulting or something like that because it seemed more interesting <laughs> at the time. Uh, but so, you know, I mean, it lets me use like my the programming skills that I learned in Atari and uh, uh, but I'm also like drawing things or creating things. So, uh, it kind of pushes a lot of my buttons. Um, and I think um, the other thing was like earlier on, um, I did sort of have that feeling like you were saying where like, how could I even get, to, you know, this is very tedious and, and has so much detail and stuff like that. And it, um, that I, I would get bored with it if I actually did it for a living. That's what I was thinking like when I was in my thirties, I think. And, but somehow I think as I've gotten older, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, it seems like I sort of like the the kind of meditative <laughs> aspect of it where you're just kind of going along and I usually listen to podcasts or whatever while I, or audiobooks while I'm working and and it's just kind of um, I like this sort of combination of skills that it requires and and, uh, and I think just I, I think generally I've been successful at it because um, I spent many years working with type and using type and learning what what uh, is good and what isn't and what I like and what I don't like and basically trying to make things that I wish existed that don't exist um, for whatever reason. Maybe it's something that's never been done before or maybe it's like an old something from old, old lettering from the 30s or something like that um, that I've seen and turn it into a font, things like that. But, uh, you said something earlier that surprised me. You said that there's scripting involved in font creation. Mm -hmm. um, 
I had no idea. Can you give me an example? Um, well, one is like, so there's font editors. The one I use is called Glyphs, but there's a couple others, uh, Font Lab and RoboFont. Those are the big ones. But, and they all work with Python. And the, the re, what's funny is the reason that Python is, is the thing that's being used is because the brother of the guy who created Python is a font designer. And so he built some tools in the late 90s using Python and incorporated it into one of the popular font editors back then. But anyway, uh, one of the things you can do is create plugins for font editors um, or even extend it, uh, extend the font editor, like the one called RoboFont can be extended using Python. Um, but you can also just write scripts that do routine things like um, cleaning up outlines or um, uh, renaming characters in a batch sort of format and stuff like that. Like uh, there's just endless ways that you can, uh, you can also use it to actually draw the characters. There's, I haven't really gotten too much into this, but it's possible to sort of, um, you know, plot uh, postscript curves or whatever um, using Python. And um, there's also a, a program called DrawBot which is Python based. And it's basically a little drawing app that instead of using a mouse or whatever to draw, you, you use Python. Uh, and it's sort of was originally meant to, as a teaching tool for teaching Python at the um, Royal Academy of the Arts in the Netherlands. Um, but it's come to be sort of used, they figured out a way to, so that you can export animated GIFs from it. And, uh, it's used a lot for making type specimens where uh, with animation in them. Uh, so you post something on Instagram with sort of an animated thing. And a lot of those are just main, made in DrawBot, which is all Python based. Hmm. Uh, it's pretty cool. So if your, your business is, is, I mean, you create fonts, but your business is getting these fonts used, getting them mm -hmm. sold. Is there SEO for fonts? Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I have a bunch of distributors that do all the selling. Uh, some people sell directly to people. I used to do that a little bit, but um, stopped doing it after a little while. Uh, so I didn't get, wouldn't get calls at five in the morning from London asking how to install a font or whatever. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and I figured it was worth the, uh, you know, little bit of a cut that I, gave up by doing that. Um, but, but yeah, so that, uh, I, you know, how, how I don't, I mean, I've got a, a popular font on the market, but I couldn't tell you how to make that happen. I mean, basically I had an idea that was right for the times, I guess, and started getting picked up. It's also similar to another popular font called Gotham that, um, came out later than my original version back in the 90s. But, um, uh, you know, when, when that became popular, I thought I should really expand my old family. And that's when I did Proxima Nova. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I guess my general theory is that people see fonts being used and that's how they get more popular. So it's kind of a snowball effect. Um, you know, if, if, if a font gets used in a prominent way, then it's likely that it'll, other people, other designers will see that and say, well, where, where can I get that font? And they'll want to use it for their work. And that's, I think, the main way that fonts uh, become popular. But hey, I do some advertising and things like that, but I don't think that's the main thing that drives it. It might get somebody to use it for the first time or something like that, but mm -hmm. if it hasn't been used much yet, but uh, yeah. Thank you. I was just curious about all these things. Um, yeah, it's sort of a mystery. <laughs> You're not the only one wondering that. Well, you, <laughs> you type designers wanted that. <laughs> but you said you said uh, something like you don't know how to make a popular font, and I, you know my business is making websites, and I, I can have like twenty great ideas for websites, and some of them are just fantastically executed and they just go nowhere and right it, you you you're just out of your control it's just the universe yeah it's very speculative i mean yeah. i'm mostly working the retail font business uh -huh. 
uh, which is unusual. As um, opposed to, sorry, retail well, there's, versus. There's also the commission font mm. business. So uh, most type designers, if they're making a living at it, make most of the money from commissions. So in other words, some corporation wants a corporate font that they have all to themselves um, or a magazine like New York Times Magazine sometimes commissions fonts um, that they use in their, you know, for a while or whatever. And you know, also publishers, corporations, stuff like that, they will sometimes get custom fonts made. And so that's, a, that's kind of a big business. Um, uh, and I've done some of that in the past, but I've been able to make a decent living just with the retail work, which is basically where you make a font and just put it out there and people either buy it or they don't. Um, it's much more speculative. And uh, so it feels, makes me feel more like um, an entrepreneur in a sense, because I'm, I have these ideas that I think will be popular and I put them out there and either they are or they aren't. Um, and so it's kind of like I'm investing my time. I don't get any money when I'm working on it. Um, and some of them I never really do make my time back in terms of the amount, they, amount of money they make. But it's one of those things where you just need a few that are popular to make it worth it. I think you meant entrepreneur. <laughs> right. Never heard that one. <laughs> Um, great. So, all right. So getting back to Atari, um, I see you've got your, your machine sitting there behind you. Um, there looks like an 800, no, 600 XL. 800 XL. Okay. Yeah. And so last time you fired it up, what'd you do with it? Um, I was playing around with action of all things, I'm trying to like learn how to use the, uh, text editor in it. I think. Okay. I'm not sure if action is my speed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it looks really interesting, um, but I kind of got stalled on it um, and recently learned about uh, something called Future Basic, or not Future Basic, what is it? Fast Basic. Fast Basic, yeah. Yeah, um, which I hadn't really heard about and uh, was really excited to see that it didn't require line numbers. <laughs> yeah. So that makes me want to learn it because it's, I already know Atari basic and it's pretty similar to that as far as I can tell and a lot faster. And I really like uh, basic XL. Uh, that's what I ended up using the most uh, mm -hmm. and still do when I'm playing around on it. But uh, yeah, that's kind of what I've been doing. Nice. I tend to use turbo basic XL, um, which is another, it's like fast basic, I think, right. but I think if I was starting today, I think fast basic might be the, the way to start, but I don't want to learn another thing right now. So, yeah, I never got into turbo basic. That seemed like one of those things that came around after I wasn't really doing much Atari stuff. Uh, like in the late eighties, maybe. Yeah. Is it? Anyway. Yeah. I think it was very late eighties. Um, when it came right. out. Yeah. So, a few things like that, like Sparta DOS and, where it's like, I don't know what those guys are doing anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so what haven't I asked you about Atari things that I should have? Uh, let's see. Um, oh, something, um, this, this sort of renewed interest um, in Atari stuff uh, uh, led to a, a, a sort of a fun thing that happened around Christmas. We spent uh, a week uh, around Christmas time this last year, um, we, my daughter and her boyfriend and my, me and my wife all sort of quarantined, <laughs> uh, got tested and then quarantined uh, so that we could spend time together uh, at Christmas. And um, I got, it, my uh, daughter's boyfriend is a, a big PC gamer. He mostly does online games. I'm not even sure which ones. It's not World of Warcraft, but it's something like that. Um, he's got a whole, you know, gaming PC set up and stuff like that. And, uh, anyway, I asked him if he wanted to play some Atari games and we spent an afternoon playing, you know, Donkey Kong and, and, uh, Ball Blazer and, and, uh, uh, you know, Rescue on Fractalis and, and all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, he really, uh, Joust, that's one of my favorites is Joust. Um, yeah. we just had a blast 
he got he was good too i mean given the considering that he'd never touched one of these old computers he was a fast learner but uh the, the, the mentioning um rescue and fractalis reminds me of something an atari uh thing that happened to me so um in 1983 there was uh the um big computer graphics expo uh what's it, i forget what it's called the seagraph mm -hmm. seagraph SIGGRAPH, yeah. Yeah, SIGGRAPH was being held in Minneapolis that year. Mm -hmm. And, uh, or maybe it was 84. It was right around that time. Anyway, I went to it. I thought, oh, this is cool. I'll go, go um, uh, and, you know, see what all this computer graphic stuff. They had like, you know, all these paint boxes. And, you know, this is before the Mac, really. And uh, uh, so it was all like high-end, you know, like stuff that, like Pixar had a booth there. And, you know, and... Uh, uh, you know, triple I and <laughs> places like that that you might recognize. Anyway, I was walking around on the floor and I recognized somebody who was walking towards me and it was David Fox, the guy who had created Rescue and Fractalis. And I recognized his picture from one of the Atari magazines that I'd been reading. Mm -hmm. And I stopped him and I said, hey, I really love your game. And I, and I had bought his graphics book. He wrote a book about Atari graphics around that time. And, and it was just really... You know, it was just a brief encounter, but it was like one of those things, like, I don't know. How exciting. Neat. Yeah, it was exciting. <laughs> uh, you mentioned uh, uh, the being in the Twin, Twin Cities. You wrote for, you were, I guess, a member of the Twin City Atari interest group, and you, you wrote for their newsletter from time yeah, to time. Yeah, once in a while, yeah, I wrote a few things. Like, you could sort of tell I was sort of losing the Atari uh, uh uh, bug a little bit because some of my later stuff I submitted uh, from printouts from my Mac. They were written in Mac, right? <laughs> and they published them as is. I said, oh, no, no, you're supposed to retype it in the dot matrix thing. <laughs> I don't want anybody to know I'm not using it in Shari, but <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I was really interested in the uh, GTA IA graphics and, and figuring out ways to do it. And so some of the things I wrote were about um like things i discovered about that you could just like be in a text mode like um you know uh the base you know graphic zero or whatever and if you hit turn on this one bit in the in the um you know in, in playlist the, right yeah I, I yeah it wasn't the display list it was it was some memory location that controlled whether gta uh, modes were enabled Mm -hmm. Like if you're in graphics eight and you and you hit this bit, it would change it to one of the gra the like nine, ten, or eleven, um, without actually doing graphics nine or graphics ten or graphics eleven. Well, you could do the same thing when you're in uh, graphics zero, and it would turn your character screen into like graphics nine or graphics ten or whatever. And so you, I had this idea of like creating special character sets that would work with that, and then. Um, um, I even did some demo programs that, that, that sort of tried out that trick where I, I, I made what looks like a graphics screen, but it's all just character graphics and it's in like graphics nine or whatever. Um, so I, I thought maybe that'd be a good way to do like game graphics or something. I don't know. And then wrote an article about it. But, uh, I don't know if anybody's ever actually used that trick. I think there was a Electric, electronic art game called um, electronics arts game called murder on the zender yes that had some kind of gta mode that they used for the background graphics hmm. but i don't know if that's how they did it hmm. or if they just you know had like a you know just a pixel screen you know i think this is my last question okay if you could send a message to the people who are still using their atari <laughs> computers today uh, and you can right now. What would you tell them? Oh, I'm I'm just glad they're there because I'm glad I'm glad there's such a big, sort of vibrant community around this uh, this obsolete machine. You know, <laughs> that uh, if it wasn't there, I, I obviously you know I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing with it now. Um, and so I'm I'm just really grateful that uh, that there's so much more you can do with it now. I mean, I was just kind of blown away, like. But things like you know the FujiNet, especially, and but also just like practically everything that existed in the '80s, like 
you know, either whether it was printed or software or whatever, you can get it online now. And um, man, that is just so amazing to me. You know, that I never would have guessed that that could be possible when I was using these computers back in the 80s. And uh, so, yeah, I just, I, I would just say a big thank you to all the people that are doing all this cool stuff, even today. I mean, it, it's just so cool to me that you can like make this sort of hybrid um, connection with modern computer stuff, you know, Raspberry Pis and, you know, um, SD cards and USB and Wi-Fi and that it, you can, and the internet and you can use all that stuff with this old computer. It's just, just amazing. <laughs>